Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, let me see if I can get my first slide. Oh, first of all, welcome to the Media Lab. And uh, I'll see if we can get my, there we go. Um, and uh, Lisa mentioned anti-disciplinary. And I'll start with that. That was a, a word that I first saw in a job description for new faculty members at the Media Lab. And we sort of discussed it. And, and some of the faculty at the Media Lab, by the, by the way, don't agree with it, but we don't agree on very much. Um, the, uh, but it doesn't mean that we're against disciplines. Um, but if you look at the title of this conference, Wearable Tech, Digital Health, Neuro, uh, Neuroscience, it's, it's, that's antidisciplinary. It's, interdisciplinary is like bioengineering, when you take two existing disciplines and just sort of mix them together. And to me, antidisciplinary is that space between the disciplines or the mix of peculiar disciplines to look Kind of one of the metaphors that one of our faculty members uses is often people look for, you know, the metaphor that you look for your keys where the, where the uh, street lights are shining and there's all this dark space. Well, a lot of those dark spaces are full of keys. And people don't go there because there's no federal funding, because you can't publish papers, and because you can't get your degree. But that uh, white space between the disciplines is uh, actually kind of the space that I think we're at the Media Lab particularly interested in. And I think when we think about the future of health, it uh, becomes tremendously important. Um, and sometimes those areas, uh, like what the area that Roz uh, created, really, uh, affective computing, becomes its own discipline uh, after a few years. So the Media Lab, and I won't go into too much detail, but we're 25 groups of uh, uh, anti-disciplinary uh, uh, endeavor, and they all sort of connect to each other, but we have everything ranging from uh, opera of the future to Raz's affective computing to uh, 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 pe people working on learning. Um, but they all sort of connect to each other, and they all affect so many different systems. And so it's really kind of a system of systems. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that Nicholas, I don't know if he, um, Lisa said she, he would be here, he, he, he said he's great at these kind of punchy phrases. And one of the phrases he said a few years ago is, bio is the new digital. And that doesn't mean necessarily completely uh, literally, but kind of metaphorically. I think if you remember in the 90s when Nicholas, uh, I think, said that uh, he, there's, a, the, he, there's a, an effect that has his name on it called the Negroponte switch, which was that uh, all uh, communication that was in the air at the time, broadcast, would go into wires. And all wired communication, like telephones, would go into the air, which he turns out to be right. And he said in the 90s that we would be getting newspapers over uh, internet, and everybody laughed at him. Um, and so, so in a way, bio, uh, digital back then was this new thing that uh, people didn't understand and people didn't think affected them. And similarly, I think people think of biology or biotech as something that the doctors and pharma companies do, when in fact probably everyone in society will be impacted by some form of uh, 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 either engineering in biology or some participation in the broader health system. And I think part of this conference is really to explore uh, how we bring some of these other disciplines together. Um, there was a, a, a paper that I saw uh, from that was published last year. And um, nothing against George and the genomic folks, but this is sort of, to me, was kind of an interesting paper because it, it, it took uh, a, a, a group of uh, uh, genetically identical twins um, and they were brought up in the same homes with the same parents, and they tracked them. And they had, um, for asthma, which is supposed to be fairly uh, correlated to genomics, is at 48.6% correlation. And for cancers, um, they had only 826 and so what's interesting is while the understanding of genomics, and we're, you know, jo George may argue that, well, it's just understanding them better, but, but clearly our current understanding of genomics isn't enough to be able to predict uh, completely what the outcomes of these kids are going to be, because these are kids with, for all of our current ability to measure what's going on with them, the doctor's appointments and the food that they eat, should have been nearly identical, but they turned out to diverge. And one of the questions that I have is how much of this is random? How much of this is actually an effect of some sort of external uh, 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 factor that we haven't been able to or haven't measured? Um, and I think you know it's sort of both. So if you think about what affects us, is we have 
multiple systems that are all interacting. We have our immune system, we have our nervous system, we have our microbial system, we have environmental factors. Some of these environmental factors, um, we, can, we can sense, some of them we can't sense, but they're all interacting in a really interesting way, and I think the science is showing that the interactions are much more integrated uh, than we previously uh, understood. And one of the questions is, well, first of all, we know from just mathematics and physics that when you have multiple variables, a multi-body problem, it's almost impossible to completely predict the outcome of complex systems, but you can start to model them. And I think one of the things that we need to think about as we think about healthcare in the future is, what are the inputs? What are the models? And how do we do these interventions? So, so, so it's diagnostic modeling and, and, and interventions. And so, and, and, and that we can't do just one system. All of the systems are affected by other systems. And I think the complexity that we have here is each of these communities have very different languages. They have different journals. They have different disciplines. And we don't even know which um, layers are the most significant uh, to measure and understand. So I think you know, we're sort of, what we, we, we've taken a lot of the low-hanging fruit uh, by using sort of trial and error uh, pharmaceutical discovery. But we're starting to, as we get into chronic disease, get into this area where we, our current models really are um, uh, obviously insufficient. Um, you know, this is, a, I, I love this picture. This is uh, shared with to me by uh, my Qigong teacher. But on the West is kind of how the West looks, left is how the West looks at the body. It's sort of a, a mechanical uh, view of the human body as sort of isolated, distinct parts that connect to each other, but be, each part being rather independent versus the sort of Eastern way of looking at the world, which is more like a garden, which is complex, interrelated, and emergent. And I think that the Eastern way, I may be biased because I'm Japanese, but the Eastern way, which is more about thinking about systems, may be the uh, more modern way that we, we might want to look at these uh, at, at our health. Um, one model, which is kind of interesting, if you think about um, weather forecasts, you know, so the weather forecasts keep getting better, but they're not perfect. So we have these models of where Hurricane Irma were going to go, and each one has a different model, but they have gotten quite a bit better because the models have gotten better, the sensing has gotten better, our understanding of some of the underlying physics has gotten better, but they're never perfect. And they get more accurate the closer you get to the event, obviously, until we know because it's on top of us. But, but, the, but the thing that's interesting is weather has not always been this predictable, right? So it happens to be at this level of predictability now. And at different scales, it has different levels of predictability. So over a long period, we can kind of predict the temperature. Over midterms, these hurricanes are sort of uh, sudden, but once they get going, we kind of have a, ver a variable view. So, so I feel like depending on the scale and depending on the system and depending on at what point in this history of the Earth you look at, the predictability and how you would predict the weather is sort of different. And so, so I don't think it's a, there's a one size fits all, but I think that weather prediction might be one way to think about um, how we think about health. And, and again, when you do weather prediction, there's so many different inputs uh, that we, we use in order to model. Um, I don't know if this is public information, but I'm going to share it because he didn't tell me I couldn't. Um, but David Kenny, who's at IBM, he, he used to run the Weather Channel. He's now um, running Watson. But he told me he had this app that um, uh, uh, helped pilots understand turbulence. And it was a popular app. People downloaded it, and it would predict when you would get turbulence based on the, the, uh, the weather models that he had. But as the pilot opened it up, it would grab the vibration data from the pilot and feed it back into the weather model. And, and, several, but, and so every time somebody opened up the app, it's increased the quality of the model to where he beca his, his uh, device became the most accurate um, turbulence uh, predictor. And so I think what's really interesting and important is to figure out how, one, how do you opportunistically gather as much data as possible, but then also do you have the right models to then turn that into uh, something that's actually predictive. Um, I think that, that sensors are tremendously important, and we'll hear from a lot of people who have lots of sensors. Uh, but my, my um, own participation in sort of sensor deployment was after the earthquake in Japan when the Fukushima reactor blew up, a number of us got together um, and tried to find Geiger counters, couldn't find them, we built them. Um, we didn't have enough uh, sensors, so we decided we would go mobile, put them on cars, and this is a whole wholly volunteer effort. And we drove around with lots of volunteers around Japan, and we have now tens of millions of data points, um, one of the largest uh, radiation, actually the largest open radiation data set in the world. Um, 
But what was kind of fascinating about this is we started out as a bunch of amateurs, but using the internet and using sort of available resources, and eventually recruiting those experts who were kind of finger wagging at us at the beginning. Um, we've become uh, a, a sort of component of the, uh, of the global sort of sensor system. Um, and then we designed our own Geiger counters, but recently we've designed and deployed air quality sensors. These are the latest uh, solar casts, and they are solar powered. You can just drop them down. Uh, they connect to the uh, cellular network at a very low special deal that we got, and are collecting um, particulates and um, air quality as well as radiation. And we will hopefully, uh, within the next six months, be able to deploy enough so we have more incoming data about the air quality than the EPA currently has. And this is all with a bunch of volunteers and a uh, volunteer factory in Romania. And, it's, uh, and so, so I think citizen science in sort, sort of both the design and deployment of sensors, but also the collection of, uh, of data is one thing that's important. And, and obviously the wearable, how do we take that, that data from wearable sensors and, and convert it and build it into a model is uh, one thing that we'll be talking about. Um, Another part is actually the, the, the science itself. So this is actually a few years ago now, probably about four years ago. This is my kitchen. And uh, this was a project called the Violation Pro Factory Project by uh, Genomicon, where they had identified, Violation is a, is a, is a target for, it's a kind of, anti, has antimicrobial um, uh, properties and possibly an a, a anti-cancer uh, target. But it's, it's expensive. It's several hundred thousand dollars a gram. But some scientists had figured out the different uh, bricks of genes to do the, each of the different phases in the pathway, published them. Um, Genomicon created this little kit that sent you the little uh, pieces of strings of DNA. Um, you could go onto their website and design the plasmid. Um, we got some old um, decommissioned uh, equipment from MIT. And in my kitchen, we were able to design and then do the uh, bacterial transformation and, and, and inject these plasmids into bacteria. And since violation's purple, you could measure how successful you were in designing a bacteria that could create violation. And then everybody uploaded their lab books and compared the colors. It was a kind of crowdsourcing citizen science project to see if we could generate this uh, potentially interesting compound um, uh, in a lab. And I, I, I apologize, at the time I didn't know that we, there was a, a, a recombinant DNA biosafety ordinance in Cambridge that didn't allow me to do this. But, um, <laughs> but I did it anyway. Um, but now some of these kids have got, created a startup where they're, they're um, creating these little lab things um, in, in a box. And, and so there's a street bio movement. And David Kong, who uh, uh, sometimes works with George uh, and is, teach, is starting a sort of democratizing bio uh, project here at the Media Lab, I think what's interesting is that um, just like the internet, um, lowered the cost of innovation, also created a sort of common platform for people to share and collaborate together, sort of unlocked open source software, free software, and also unlocked a lot of innovation that was done in dorm rooms rather than in large institutions. That actually was one of the reasons that Boston lost its advantage. There's a great book by Annalise Saxenian called Regional Advantage about how Boston loses computing to Silicon Valley because we had the the, the capital, the expertise, the institutions, but we didn't allow people to do this sort of grassroots innovation and that a lot of that went to the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Similarly, I feel like street biology right now is, is, is emerging as a really interesting place, whether we're talking about genomics or chemistry or, or hacking the human body. And, um, and you know, they're, 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 they're innovative in, in, in a slightly different way, but, but in similar ways to how startups sort of disrupted the traditional um, uh, computer companies. MIT you know, what is involved uh, in this. We uh, created and then spun out the Inter International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, iGEM, um, which has been here now for many years. I think the last year there were probably 6,000 participants, but this is sort of junior high and high school kids um, first, one of the things they do is they're creating these bio bricks um, where they're trying to catalog uh, different uh, uh, sequences and, and their behaviors, and then other kids will combine them together to try to create uh, interesting um, biological machines. Uh, and you know, and the, the, these kids are, are amazingly creative, but like how we used to have robot competitions, we still have robotics competitions, we, we have genomics competitions. Um, you know, some people will look at this and like, well, what could go wrong? I think, um, well, the FBI clearly said, well, this is interesting. Um, and so they've actually been sponsoring iGEM for quite a while. And, and there's a wonderful uh, uh, a person whose slide I use with permission, Ed, um, 
Yu, who uh, is in charge of the, uh, I think it's Weapons of Mass Destruction and Biological uh, uh, Terrorism Unit or something like that. And he, he's been sponsoring iGEM, and he's also been sponsoring a number of meetups of all of the uh, uh, biohacking groups from around the world. Um, and his view, and he's done a very good job of sort of instilling a set of values. So he said, you know, we kind of did it wrong with the internet where we turned the hackers against us. But with uh, this new community and by reaching out and, and explaining to them that, well, look, you, you kids are part of the defense against something going terribly wrong and that uh, you need to work uh, together with us. And he's, he's, I think, instilled, not in all of them, there are a couple of people on the fringe, but for the most part, most of them feel like they're on the side of, of trying to defend us from extinction events that um, George is often so worried about. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the values is really important. I don't need you to go through all of these, but this is um, Donella Meadows, uh, who worked with Jay Forrester in coming up and thinking about systems dynamics. And she has a very eloquent article about this. But these are, when you look at complex self-adaptive systems, she talks about the things that you can do to intervene. And these are in reverse order. So you, know, you can change things like the, the length of delays, the rules, the goals. And last but most important, she talks about paradigm shifts. So, so as we think about the human body as a garden, as a system of systems, it really is a, a very uh, much a self-adaptive complex system that she talked about. And you can go in and try to intervene with, uh, in particular components. You can try to intervene in changing things around. But I think one of the most powerful places to intervene is sort of the, the lower ones, like the goals, the mindset, and the paradigm. And I think one of the things um, is, for instance, with, with this community of kids, is to really make sure that their paradigm and their goals are appropriate. Um, just a few examples to, to illustrate this. So I, I think everybody knows Monopoly, um, and everybody's played Monopoly. Well, it turns out in, in 1902, 1903, it, it, it's based on a previous game um, called the Landlord's Game. And it was designed to be a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing and all of the usual outcomes and consequences. So it was a game to teach kids how horrible um, the idea of land ownership and rent was and how it drove people to bankruptcy. But Parker Brothers then takes his game, um, basically doesn't change the rules, but changes the goal to become the landlord and make your friends bankrupt. And it becomes very popular, right? So, so the, the key point here is just that changing the goal without changing the rules changes the outcome, maybe more than changing the rules, right? And so another example, this was from one of our uh, faculty members. Uh, uh, Kevin Slavin turned me on to this. But you know, I don't know if you've heard of this. This is in Las Vegas. This is called the Heart Attack Grill. And there is a quadruple bypass burger, which is, I think, over 8,000 calories. Um, the, 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 the staff are dressed up as nurses, and you put a smock on, get wheeled in, to, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, wheelchair. You eat free if you're more than 350 pounds. Um, and uh, several people have had cardiac arrests while they were there. And the important thing, the point I'm making here is it's not an information problem for some people, right? It's not about labeling the food. It's clear what's going on here when they go to this place. And so I think, again, they have certain people have a certain paradigm. They have a certain goal in life. And just explaining to them that it's not healthy is not enough. You have to kind of change behavior at uh, another level. So, so again, not all of us will go here. But my point is that um, you know, this, this has something to do with um, what we have set as the goals of American society. Um, so you know, I love this uh, quote. This is uh, uh, Andrew Fletcher, who was a, a 1970s uh, Scottish uh, uh, politician. And he said, you know, let me make the songs of a nation. I care not who makes the laws. Which is really this notion that songs can outlast and have more influence on society than maybe its laws. And again, nothing against make changing laws, and we actually need to intervene at every layer. But one of the most obvious layers that we need to intervene at um, that we often forget, I think, is the, the layer of culture and the, and the layer of these our, our sort of intuition and sensibilities. So I just wanted to uh, urge that. And I'll, I'll um, end with, a, uh, with one of my um, um, favorite stories. And this, I think many of you may already know this story, but it's called the uh, the lucky ironfish story. And it was, uh, I think, some Canadian health workers who were in Cambodia. 
and there was this anemic um, problem. People just weren't getting enough iron. And they were trying very hard to get the villagers to take the supplements. Um, um, but people just w wouldn't comply. They, didn't, they weren't interested. They didn't really understand the correlation. But what they realized is, was that there was some sort of uh, uh, superstition or, 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 or culture that there was a, a particular fish that was considered lucky. So they created the lucky iron fish, which is this chunk of iron that's shaped like a fish. And they started giving it away, and now you, they can, you can buy it online. And what you do is it's a lucky fish that you put whenever you're making your soup, and it just boils with your water and emits iron. And through the sort of, the sort of distribution of these lucky iron fish, they were uh, mostly able to um, cure. Uh, you know, with, they had 90% compliance, 50% uh, decrease in iron deficiency. Um, and, uh, and, and this fish lasts for five years. And so, so I guess my, my point is that you know, some of the, w once we do the science, we can often figure out uh, what needs to happen. But as we think about actually deploying the therapeutics, about compliance and things like that, you really do need to understand the culture. And some, even if you're doing a non-cultural intervention, thinking about culture, I think in the intervention is really important. And, uh, and so I, you know, I, th I think this is sort of obvious, but this is also, I think, part of the theme of this conferences, I think that you know, medicine and health have traditionally been things that happen in the hospital that involve the delivery of molecules through pills um, and shots. And basically, it was sort of doctors and pharma. And I think that if you think about everything that affects us, it's everything from everything that happens in your home, all the consumer electronics that we are uh, connected to, um, and all the nutrition. And a lot of these things, you know, I've, I've been looking at you know, businesses that are involved in health and nutrition their margins are so thin, so they can't X, Y, Z. Or you know, when we're talking about um, uh, therapeutics that are uh, delivered in a uh, electronic way, a digital way, well, you don't get the uh, insurance company payer model, so we can't invest this much money. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's also a, a fundamental broken business model that we have, uh, particularly in the US, I think, with the current insurance uh, 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 pharma distribution and, 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 and hospital model. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to crack this. I mean, I think there are certain countries where we don't have the incumbent structure, and maybe some of those places where will be where we see innovation. Um, some of the things um, are things that we can develop with business models that don't require the uh, super high margins that you get through the, the pharma system. But um, figuring out how, one, um, we sort of support the funding of and uh, actually do the deployment of uh, diagnostics and therapeutics that don't fit into the traditional uh, hospital and, uh, 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 and, and drug model. But, but also, more importantly, I think, is as we go back to sort of my first idea of thinking about this as a system of systems, is that to create a, something like a weather model, there needs to be a lot of collaboration. And I think one of the other problems is with intellectual property and sort of the way that we do funding, a lot of the, um, our data that we're going to be creating isn't easily shared and isn't easily built together into a model. And, and the, the idea of what is the governance, um, I know, again, I keep pointing at George because I see him there and he's so tall. But, um, but you know, like the personal genomics projects, I mean, wh what are the projects that can be uh, possibly neutral and not-for-profit where we can bring researchers and data together to try to understand and um, experiment with these models? I think you know, the US government has been a leader in thinking about things like weather models. Um, I don't know whether we have uh, governmental leadership in, in, in this space. And so wh where does that go? That, that's another a question that I have. Um, and so I think that there definitely is a role for uh, uh, business and startups um, in this space, but I think there's also a really important role for a nonprofit coordination of some of these things so that we can understand and deploy uh, uh, some of these um, therapeutics and, and, and diagnostics in an effective way. And it has to be an international effort, I believe. But I, I really look forward to the rest of the day, and I think it's pretty amazing to see these different groups being uh, converged. And thank you very much, Lisa, for giving us this opportunity.